Good evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, the Editor-in-Chief of Guardian Australia, Catherine Viner, Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, Josh Frydenberg, musician and Pacific rights advocate, David Bridie, who's best known for his band, Not Drowning, Waving, businesswoman and Chair of Manufacturing Australia, Sue Morfitt, and Shadow Communications Minister, Jason Clare. Please welcome our panel. As usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio, and you can join the Twitter conversation or send us a question by using the Quanda hashtag that's just appeared on your screen. Our first question comes from Dan Cregan. Political and business leaders often agree that certain financial institutions are too big to fail. Are there other Australian companies that are too big to fail? And is Qantas one of those companies? Catherine Viner, is Qantas one of those companies? Well, um, since, we've, uh, since, we've, the, since the audience has arrived, there's been a big development actually in this story, which is uh, Tony Abbott has announced that Qantas is going ha to have no sale, um, uh, no debt guarantee, but um, the uh, Qantas Sale Act is going to be uh, lifted. The crucial parts of it, which mean that um, restrictions on foreign ownership are going to be gone, um, that any number of non-Australians can be on the board, um, uh, the, the headquarters don't even need to be in Australia. It doesn't even need to be called Qantas anymore. Um, this is if it gets through the Senate. So it's a big development today. Uh, Josh Reidenberg, well, you perhaps better pick up from that. I mean, uh, if Qantas is too big to fail, is it a good idea to allow all these things to happen? Might not even be Qantas in the future. Well, firstly, it's a very important announcement by the Prime Minister. Uh, essentially, what he's trying to do is protect thousands of Australian jobs and to free up Qantas uh, to, to survive and prosper as a 93-year-old Australian icon. You see, you have to understand, Tony, that Qantas is facing a number of strong headwinds. Firstly, it's competing against big Asian and Middle Eastern airlines. For example, Emirates uh, only started in 1985 with one plane. It recently put an order in for 350 new planes with Qatar and Etihad. Virgin's been competing extremely aggressively. It's put 900,000 seats just last year, additional seats to win capacity. And, of course, the input costs for Qantas have gone up dramatically. A $106 million bill on the carbon tax and the legacy of trade union deals from some time ago mean that the wages costs for Qantas are 24% of its revenue compared to, for example, Cathay Pacific, where it's just 15% and Singapore Airlines just 11%. So we've said drastic action is required. That drastic action is to, as Catherine said, to repeal Section 3 of the Qantas Sale Act. If it needs to have drastic action for mm. Qantas to survive, why not give it a debt guarantee, which is something you can do, rather than promise to put legislation through which may not, in fact probably won't, go through the Senate? Well, we hope it's going to go through the Senate and, uh, you know, there will be some of the independents who will support it. The reason why we haven't gone down which the Which ones, path, by the way? Well, uh, let's just wait and see. Clive Palmer is not one of them. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, there are some others. Well, that's um, two senators the, uh, that he the has ones, the ones there and possibly an extra senator if the West Australian yeah. election goes the way you wouldn't want it to go. Um, the independent senator from South Australia, uh, formerly of Family First, has said that he is in favour of lifting the Qantas Sale Act. Um, but, you know, we need to take this action and we also need to get rid of the carbon tax, which is a $106 million drag on Qantas. So, look, we're hoping this will provide an answer. The reason why, to answer your question, we haven't gone the, down the path of the debt guarantee uh, debt guarantee is because if we offer it to Qantas, do we offer it to Virgin? Virgin has 8,000 Australian employees, Tony. Um, Rex is also struggling at the moment. Do we offer to Rex? It, it fulfils important regional routes. Neither of those are national carriers and so the sure. uh, criteria that uh, Joe Hockey laid out a few weeks ago when he seemed to be indicating a debt guarantee was on the cards are not fulfilled by either of those airlines. Well, I understand that the Cabinet had a very full discussion tonight. Every member spoke and that's the decision they came to and, you know, I think it's the right decision. Let's hear from uh, the other side of politics, Jason Clare. Now, I mean, Tony Abbott's put it back into Labor's court here. He mm. said that uh, if Labor wants to let Qantas bleed, it will not support this act to change majority ownership rules. Well, Qantas is our national airline and it should remain uh, majority Australian-owned. Uh, that's Labor's view. Uh, the, the reforms that the Prime Minister's talked about this evening mean that the head office of Qantas could go overseas could mean the board goes overseas, could mean all of the maintenance work goes overseas, and as Catherine said, you could even change the name Qantas. 
Why government's... would you do that, by the way? I mean, it's a pretty good brand. I mean, why would you get rid of a brand like Qantas? Well, it'd be silly to change the name, and it's not smart either to send thousands of jobs overseas. We've, we've been told last week you, that we're going to lose 5,000 Qantas jobs, and if this was to pass the parliament, then thousands more maintenance jobs would go overseas, and that's why Labor will not support that. And uh, how do you see the numbers lying in the Senate? Because currently it wouldn't get through the Senate. The new reconfigured Senate may be different, or will it? Well, it's too early to tell. We've got a, uh, a by-election in WA as well. Uh, the, the point I, I, I want to make is that when Tony Abbott was in opposition, he said no to everything. We're prepared to take a constructive approach here. Whilst we say that Qantas must remain majority Australian-owned, we're happy to look at other provisions in Part 3 about 25% ownership by a single entity or 35% by a single airline. We think there's room to move there. We also think a debt guarantee that gives Qantas access to cheaper capital is an option that should be considered. But what we won't support is more jobs going overseas. I've got a friend of mine who's worked for Qantas for 40 years. He's 56. He's terrified at the moment at the prospect that he's one of the 5,000. If this went through Parliament, then there's more Qantas workers who could lose their jobs overseas. Sue Morfitt, uh, you ran a company where the jobs did go overseas. Um, do you think this is likely for Qantas? Is it the sort of thing that may need to happen? It is difficult. I don't know what will happen with Qantas because you need to be in a business to understand exactly the decisions that they need to make. I think the most important thing is that Qantas um, is being able to be put on a level playing field. We can't bubble wrap um, our... Um, Australian icons under any circumstances, they need to have the opportunity to either be um, a national carrier and sponsored by the government, like Air New Zealand is, or otherwise they need to be given a free rein and get on with being a competitive business. It is extremely difficult for any business to offshore jobs, but sometimes you... And, and I'm not suggesting that Qantas will need to do an enormous amount of that. It may have the opportunity to um, reverse and be strong, so we don't know that. But if you do need to do that, sometimes you might need to forgo some jobs in order to save so many more. And they're tough decisions that companies need to the make. The question I ask, is it too big to fail? Is Qantas too big to fail? What's your view on that? Well, I wouldn't like to think that it was going to fail. I think the Qantas brand is so strong and I think that um, with the correct management and ownership structure that is able to be put in, I think that they should do a good job. Let's go back to the question. When you ask the question about too big to fail, are you worried that governments think like that? There's an element of moral hazard in that intervention. I'd be interested to hear the panel out on that aspect. Yeah, well, Jason, Maybe just to add, add to that, uh, Joe Hockey said a couple of weeks ago that he thought Qantas was a special case because if it did fail, it would have enormous impacts on the economy. Uh, he also made the point that it's more regulated than other airlines and other airlines get access to cheaper capital than Qantas. And he was making a case there for a debt guarantee. He's now been rolled in, in Cabinet effectively, they're not going to do that. But you've got the Treasurer of the country there saying Qantas is a special case and you only have to stop for a second and have a think about what would happen to Australia if Qantas wasn't there. It grounded its airlines only two years ago and it caused enormous chaos for uh, a couple of days in Australia. If that was to no, happen... I'd, I'd like to hear from the question, would you, would you be comfortable to see uh, Qantas become uh, a company which is not majority Australian owned? Fresh capital is required and that's the only place it's going to come from. I'm open to that idea. Mm. David Brady, <clears throat> can I hear from you? We haven't heard from your, your position yet. Musicians tend to fly virgin because they give us better freight options. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, I did a film once out at... Uh, I did the soundtrack of the film out at Longreach. Um, and it's the birthplace of Qantas. It's called the Queensland and Northern Territory Air Service. It does strike me that uh, letting... Ford and Holden go a couple of weeks back, SPC. The national airline is, um, is something that we hold quite dear. Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu have their own national airlines. Um, is it sort of... A, are you saying it's kind of emotional or...? I think uh... it's a symbolic thing, yeah, very yeah. much so. And it, it, uh, if the government is saying this, it's in some way saying that anything goes. So I just kind of say, um, you know, we're dealing with a commercial airline and nobody wants to see Qantas fail. In fact, there is demand out there for it to survive and prosper. And I think Sue made the very important point that we're talking about creating a level playing field. This is no... We don't live in the world of uh, government ownership anymore. Um, Jason's 
own party was responsible for Qantas being uh, taken out of government hands in the first place. You did the same with the Commonwealth Bank and we did the same with Telstra. There's a bipartisan approach to that. When the going gets tough commercially, you can't just put your hand up and say as a government, well, look, we're going to go to the taxpayer and say you need to subsidise this company. We've got a taxpayer with a hand up in the sure. audience there. We'll go to that gentleman there. Go ahead. Uh, to the panel, I'm just wondering, it seems the conversation we keep having is the only way we can compete globally now is by cutting wages and conditions in Australia. And I'm trying to work out, is that the government policy? The only way forward is just to keep cutting wages and, and blaming uh, workers of Australia? That... It's absolutely not uh, the policy. The policy is how do we lift productivity? Um, Martin Ferguson, a sort of doyen of the Labor Party, said we can't live and operate in a world which is a global in, uh, environment with lower product, falling productivity and higher wages. So something's got to give at that time. So what we do need is better cooperation between companies and also their workers, and we also need higher productivity, and that's using new technology, investing in skills, and investing in infrastructure. We're, I'll tell you what, we're going to come back to uh, those uh, questions about sure. productivity and so on later in the sure. programs. Just sticking with Qantas for the moment, sure. would you be happy as it was almost canvassed um, as a possibility in the Prime Minister's press conference that the airline could be split up into an international carrier and a domestic carrier. We know the international carrier will struggle under circumstances like that um, because it's, it's actually having trouble uh, making a profit now. Look, I wouldn't like to see that, but what I would like to see is... But could that happen and would you care if it did? Well, we uh, haven't changed the Air Navigation Act, which is the restriction of 49% on foreign ownership, which Virgin also has to live by currently. So Qantas, as an Australian-based airline operating internationally, would have to live by that existing Air Navigation Act. So it's possible Possibly they could change their business structures, as you, as you suggest. But, you know, the, the point here is the fundamental point, which is we want Qantas to survive. They've just announced a massive couple of hundred million dollar loss. They've just announced 15% of their workforce going at 5,000. And they're coming now to the taxpayer and saying, can you guarantee our debt? And we've said as a government, if we do it for you, we have to do it for others. And these are Why tough is that, times. by the way? Uh, that doesn't really make that much sense. Well, I John... mean, uh, it, you can make as a government uh, sure. specific decisions related to a national carrier. Sure. Um, so why can't you because do that? Jo I, because uh, John Borghetti has just said, the minute, if you were to give a... Uh, debt guarantee to Qantas, within 24 hours he'd be putting the same request on the desk of government. They employ 8,000 Australians. They also just released a loss. They also have a big carbon tax bill. You know, I don't think government should be getting into the business of picking winners. What government should but on be on the one hand, you're saying that particular airline sure. is backed by a giant countries spending huge fortunes. Sure. And on the other hand, you're saying they're going to be in trouble. Uh, well, if you give a debt guarantee to the company that doesn't have that look, advantage. they've got 8,000 Australian employees, they've got a loss and, you know, they're trying to aggressively grab market share. I mean, Tony, Qantas is facing difficult times and we're hoping that this change, this change to the Qantas Sale Act, if passed by the Senate, will actually produce a more viable right. and prosperous... We've got airline. another question, got another question from the floor. Go ahead. Um, you say that you want Qantas to survive but that's the same thing you said about Holden and the same thing you've said about SPC and the same thing you've said about both Toyota and Ford. How is the government's policy on this issue to just let the free market handle it and hope for the best any different? Well, in terms of... Um... <laughs> well, the good news... Um, thanks very much for that question. The good news is SPC is surviving. And uh, it is... Thanks to the Victorian government. Thanks to the Victorian government, but also... <laughs> thanks... Um, also thanks, Tony, to a parent company, Coca-Cola Amatil, mm. which has just turned hundreds of millions of dollars lost. But can you I see? just make the point? I mean, yep. the, it, it does actually strengthen the point made by the questioner, because in reality, the federal government was prepared not to see that extra money go in that would have helped Coca-Cola Amatil, as they say, keep that company going. But, you know, we made the decision that the company, uh, in this case, uh, could survive if Coca-Cola Amatil st um, stood up. The, the issues of Toyota, Holden, um, Ford, they're much more complex. Um, they've received huge subsidies from the taxpayers over many years. They're competing with very, um, you know, t uh, in a tough operating environment. Um, those companies are also dealing with difficult, uh, difficult employment situations. Um, those companies, those companies did made the look, okay, look, decision. Let's go, let's go back to, to our questioner there, Josh. Sure. Sorry to subvert down here, but 
How can you argue that, you know, they're, you know, dealing with difficult employment issues when the government blamed the union for, to for Toyota going overseas, yet, you know, the unions and Toyota then come out and say very clearly that it wasn't the union's fault? Let's and how can the same thing apply to then Toyota, um, sorry, to Qantas, when you're talking about Qantas having too high of a wage when the average Qantas wage is only a little over $56,000? Go ahead. Okay. Well, just a short well, answer and then we'll hear from others. Short answer. On Toyota, weeks before their announcement, they were in the federal court trying to get a change to their enterprise agreement. They couldn't and they were trying to do with, their, with, with the unions. Um, at the end of the day, it's about productivity. Um, look, wages are just one part of the factor. Higher energy input costs are another part. The high Australian dollar is another factor. There are lots of factors at play here, but wages has certainly been one of them. Uh, Catherine, one of the factors at play here is going to be politics. We've talked a little bit about what the Senate might or might not do, but it does seem, in fact, this is putting off a decision uh, to help Qantas because politics will get in the way. It's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's almost like Tony Abbott wants an unholy row uh, by doing this because uh, people are going to be absolutely furious. Um, my sense is that Australians really value uh, Qantas as a national icon, as a kind of Australian brand, an Australian identity, down to the kangaroo. And um, I think he's, he's, um, he, he clearly wants a fight. Um, David... Let's hear from you on that, because you, you obviously have that view. Do you think that the Australian public will care one way or the other if they still have an airline that's called Qantas that's taking people overseas but just happens to be foreign owned? I think this one might be a bridge too far. Yeah. Um, it does also strike me that if uh, we're relying on the Senate for such an important decision, some of the senators that we have there, <laughs> the way they've been elected and what they represent, that perturbs me a little bit. It's kind of uh, some odd parties that are <laughs> holding the decision. So, uh, what do you think about the, the whole thing now being effectively going to be put in the hands of the Senate? Difficult. Yeah. But I do think that eventually common sense must prevail because it's such a good brand. It's, it's so powerful. It's so iconically linked with our nation. We need it to be commercially strong so we need to give it its best shot. But when you say com common sense must prevail, do well, you mean by that um, there should be a debt guarantee because that's what you can do quicker to help it survive? Or do you mean we should wait and see how the vagaries of politics work out? I think we should wait until so we see how the vagaries of politics pay out, which is um, an unusual thing to say for someone who's in business that wants things to be done quickly. But if we give a debt guarantee to one, we have to give it across the board, and I find that probably yeah. not appropriate. Well, Tony, I disagree with that because I think... Qantas is a special case. It's the national carrier. Virgin isn't. And uh, Joe Hockey made, the, made, made a number of points recently why it is a special case and why you can isolate it. And to my mind, if the government can give $16 million to a chocolate factory in Tasmania, then why can't it go out of its way to help our national carrier? Because that was during an election campaign. <laughs> That's exactly um, right. Let's go to our next question. <laughs> go ahead. It's from Andrew Wilson. Senator Stephen Conroy accused Lieutenant General Angus Campbell of being engaged in a political cover-up. Cover he had no trouble issuing an apology to Mark Latham for a statement he denied making. So why isn't Senator Conroy man enough to apologise to General Campbell? And why does Mr Shorten keep him on? Let's start with our non-politician, Sue Morfitt. Um, you've obviously watched uh, the Conroy um, debacle, some would call it. Um, what do you think? I think, one, it was inappropriate. I think, two, that the military take um, their writing instructions from the government and so, therefore, I think that we should respect that and recognise it and I think that uh, it was not his best moment. David Bridie, I think you've got a, uh, a brother in the military, haven't you? Yeah, my, um, my older brother's over in Afghanistan at the moment. He'll be there for the next uh, 12 months. Um, was this like an, a, an extension, an insult extended out to all the No, no, he's, he's going military? over there to uh, help train um, uh, Afghani uh, military over there since the um, uh, Australian troops have come back. Um, but how do you suppose he would regard this Conroy oh, suggestion that the military are covering up? His attitude would be that they're not above scrutiny. So that in, in, um, in the past, in, when mistakes have been made, when there's been bastardisation, accusations at Duntroon, the sex tapes, um, 
misuse of that military power that uh, scrutiny is required and scrutiny makes the military better. And they're not above um, uh, being accused. But uh, it's, it strikes me in this case that the issue is uh, that, um, that the Lieutenant General is uh, being caught account. It's, it's quite a politicised question. He's, he's being made to act out the, the stop the boats issue, which is a very political um, uh, exercise. So he does need to be held to account, I think. Josh Reidenberg. Well, David's ex absolutely right. Um, the military are not above scrutiny. In fact, they face a, a lot of scrutiny. And my, also my starting position here is no political party, uh, Jason's or mine, has a monopoly on patriotism. Just like when it comes to the boats issue, none of us have a monopoly on compassion. But what concerned me and my colleagues about this issue with Senator Conroy was it was a premeditated attack. He was actually counselled by some of his colleagues before the Senate he um, estimates hearing, do not go down this path. He went down that path uh, and then he failed to apologise. And that is just compounding the hurt. And, you know, I don't know what um, Senator Conroy was thinking, uh, because obviously, he, as Shadow Defence Minister, he has a special responsibility. In fact, a Labor former Shadow Treasurer here in New South Wales, Michael Costa, said yesterday, he has no credibility, Senator Conroy, and now his position is untenable. Now, that's coming from a Labor uh, former State Treasurer saying that. So I think Senator Conroy has a lot to answer for, and Bill Shorten, as his leader, needs to assert his leadership and pull him into line. Jason Clare. I think what Stephen said was wrong. Um, I know... Should he apologise? Well, that's a matter for him. He's withdrawn. Um, that'd be a matter for him. I, Would you I, like I know, to see him apologise? I, I know the Major General very well because I was a, a Defence Minister for two years and I think that he's a, a good man, a man that I respect enormously. I don't think that uh, he's engaged in a political cover-up at all. Uh, I do think that the unnecessary secrecy around Operation Sovereign Borders has put him in an awful position. Uh, we know less about what is going, off, going on in the seas off Australia than, for example, we know has happened in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, John Curtin told us more about what was happening on the Kokoda track than we're being told now about what's happening um, north of Australia. So if there was less secrecy, uh, I think we'd be able to address this in a mature fashion. But the way Stephen went about it was the wrong way. So you blame the government but not the military? Well, I agree with Josh that the military uh, are, are not above criticism and they're not above investigation. So, so is there a widespread view among Labor MPs that the military should not be in this role? No. No. Let me, let me put it this way. Um, Tony, you know I was Minister for Home Affairs for two years. Through all of that time, no one in uniform ever said to me, we shouldn't provide information on what's happening with border protection. <laughs> Never once was I ever told that this information would help people smugglers. And yet now suddenly we're told that it is. And it's very clear to me that this is a political edict, that we should not provide any information to the public, and the premise should be that it's going to help people smugglers. Now that is nonsense. I know it's nonsense because no one in the military ever told me that this was necessary to stop the boats. Catherine Viner, what do you think? I'd agree with that. I think um, there's a crazy amount of secrecy, which is quite naive in the modern world when everyone's got mobile phones and Facebook accounts and, and we've got good journalists going to try and find out what's really happening. Um, but, but, but they can't because they can't go there. Yeah, the, well, it's hard to go there, but when we do get stories, we get them through these other methods. But I think um, the, the, the government's sort of using the military to sort of shield themselves and what it's doing. Those questions should have been for um, Minister Morrison. They shouldn't have been for the General. Josh, you want to respond to that? Well, he's absolutely involved in the approach that the military and the government are taking to this issue. So it's appropriate that he faces a Senate estimates. And to Jason's point um, about how uh, this information, he was never told that this information would be helpful to people smugglers if it was released. In fact, that's what you know, Major General Campbell himself has said at the Senate estimates. You do not want that information to be handed out to people smugglers. You do not want to jeopardise operations. You do not know what them to know what the Navy is effectively doing to, uh, you know, to prevent um, these boat arrivals. Okay. So that's from him, that's from the right. General himself. All right, let's go to our next questioner, which is on a related subject, and the questioner is Paige Burton. Uh, following the riot on Manus Island, the government's announced a review into violence on offshore centres. 
Does this lack of urgency reflect the government's indifference to human rights abuses, or is it an effective way to make sure some action is finally taken? Well, it's completely unacceptable what happened there in, in Manus. I mean, Reza Barati, a 24-year-old Iranian, tragically lost his life. And as you say, there is a review being undertaken uh, within the department. There's a coronial inquiry. There's a police investigation. Um, there was, you know, issues in terms of getting the right information when Scott Morrison went for, first went public with it. But uh, the point is, you know, Manus was a policy that the Labor Party um, also subscribed to when they were in in government. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, our, sure, a, I'm sure we'll get to that point. Sure. Stick with the murder, or the killing, I should say, of this uh, young 23-year-old asylum seeker, Reza Barati. Yeah. Is that a homicide investigation now? Well, it's a coronial... I understand there's a coronial inquest and there's a police investigation. I don't. But not... it may, if some accounts are to be believed, it could well be the police who are involved well, in the death. So could they really be responsible for investigating well, I, I mean, if the evidence is there, whoever did this should be punished, unequivocally. But is it the responsibility of the Australian government to investigate the death of someone in their care? Well, there's a police investigation being taken place by the PNG police, but we're obviously fully engaged. The other point to mention... But shouldn't Tony, there be Australian homicide detectives, AFP detectives on the ground investigating this killing? Well, that might be your view. Uh, Scott Morrison... Should there be? I'm well, asking you. Well, um, you know, Scott Morrison was recently in Papua New Guinea, just came back, I think, you know, two days ago. Um, I don't know the exact nature of those discussions, but certainly ensuring that there's not a repeat of that violence in Manus, and that's taking into account the departmental review, taking into account the coronial inquiry, taking into account the police inquiry, trying to get to the bottom of it to ensure nothing like this happens. Well, I'll just make the point, because the review says any evidence of criminal activity obtained by the review will be handed to the relevant authorities, that being presumably the PNG police. Presumably, you're right. Who may be investigating their own office. Officers. Well, uh, just like we've investigated our own officers. And, right. and, okay, well, you know, okay, if that's the situation, let me ask David Bridie, because you've been to Manus Island many times. What do you think about this? Um, well, the mobile police squad, who early reports are saying are responsible for, for, the, for this uh, killing, um, they're paid for by the Australian government, but their, their job is to protect a private company, which is G4S, that they protect the perimeter of the detention centre in Manus. So you have to ask who, who is going to take responsibility because it falls between the gaps. And there's been a lot of... Um, uh, throughout this whole issue up at Manus Island, there's been a lot of saying, well, that, no, that's the Papua New Guinean government's responsibility. No, that's the Australian government's responsibility. No, that's the private company's um, uh, responsibility. So actually uh, getting to the... Uh, the germ of what the problem here is not uh, necessarily that um, easy. But the mobile police squad, they're, they're like the goon squad up there. They're, they're, um, they were sent in at Bougainville to do a lot of the dirty work to um, uh, raise villages to the ground. They're also at the same up in the highlands of PNG to protect the company LNG PNG to um, if there's <coughs> landowners who are um, uh, getting a bit uppity. Uh, in Port Moresby, there was a, a settlement that the government was, was concerned about because of a whole lot of criminal activity going there. And it was the mobile police squad that went in that uh, uh, raised this settlement to the ground. That the, these, they... are, these are allegations, I should add. I, I don't know if any of this has been absolutely proven. Is that right? I, I would be... I've never met anyone in PNG who's refuted this. They're not, they're not the military, they're not the police force. In fact, the police and the military in Papua New Guinea dislike the mobile police Is it squad. your understanding that they are the ones investigating this killing? Does anyone know the answer to that? I think they're the people who respond... I think they're the, the lot who are responsible for it. Yes. Let, let me ask... Uh, I'll just quickly go back to Josh Reidenberg because uh, there are three versions of how this man was killed. Stomped to death on the ground head stoved in by a riot shield or beaten across the head with a length of timber. Um, by the way, that's News Limited reporting. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm simply making the point that that is uh, a, a pretty... Uh, the sort of account that you would have to say your government would take seriously. Absolutely. So do you know who's actually investigating the killing? Well, as I said, there's three levels of investigation that are currently going on and they haven't you know, fully completed and one is the coronial, one is the police, and one is a, a serious um, departmental review. So I'm sure when that is 
when those inquiries have played out, um, you know, it, you've got to understand it's in the government's interest, Tony, for this not to happen again, mm. right? We do not want to see a, a young man lose his life when he is uh, in a, a detention facility, as David said, that, you know, we have paid for. So close right? it down. Close it down. Well, if we close it down... <laughs> uh, I'm going to... I'll just pause there because we'll come back to that issue. Sure. I just want to hear from Jason Clare on this. Anything in particular, Tony? Well, uh, yes, the, the issue of whether the review is appropriate uh, and whether the investigation of that man's death is appropriate, the way it's been conducted. Well, it needs to be full and it needs to be independent. Someone's died in Australia's care and control. And so it's very important that the investigation determines how the person died and who was responsible for it. Uh, and so... Number one, it needs to be it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to get to the truth. Uh, it may require a parliamentary inquiry as well. Uh, but I'm glad that the government has agreed to an inquiry. We need to make sure that we stop people drowning at sea, and we need to make sure that people are safe when they're in Australian care and control. Okay, we've got a video question. Anyone with their hands up? No, I can't see anyone. The, the, we've got a video question uh, again on this subject. A, a slightly broader question. It's from Brian Davies in Roomba, New South Wales. It's been revealed that Manus Island detainees have no possibility of being resettled anywhere as the PNG government has no plans or legislation for their resettlement. Indefinite detention without charge or trial is illegal under the PNG constitution. Our High Court ruling on offshore detention made clear that any place designated by the Minister must have the capability for resettlement. If the Gulag is illegal under both PNG and Australian law, then why is it still open? Let's start with David Bridey. Um, do you have any idea what the Papua New, Gu New Guinea government is likely to, uh, to do about resettlement? Because you wrote an article um, just a few days ago suggesting that they will not resettle uh, any of these people in Papua New Guinea. When the Papua New Guinea Prime Minister Peter O'Neill first signed on for this, he signed on for a regional proce processing centre that Papua New Guinea would help their, uh, uh, their good allies, Australia, out by um, allowing the detention centre to be placed at Manus Island, which is an old Australian naval base. It used to be called Lombrum. Um, and that they would be in for the, the processing only. I don't think they bought into settlement. Um, uh, and Papua New Guinea is not a country that has a history of, of, of people being settled, of, of migration. It's, um, even though there's nearly 900 language groups there, Apart from the Chinese who have been there since the late 19th century, there are no other ethnic groups there. It's not a place where you wake up on a Saturday morning and there's, um, you know, rental properties in the post Korean newspaper or um, there isn't jobs. All the land's cus it's customary owned. Um, it has strange services as it is. I, I can't imagine how um, a group of Tamils, Iranians, Iraqis and Afghanis would would settle in Port Moresby, certainly not on, on Lorengau where Manus Island is, because a, it's a very small place. So I can't imagine that Papua New Guinea would be um, uh, uh, buying into this. There's also domestic, there's domestic opposition politically, but I don't think Papua New Guinean people, even though they're quite, um, you know, they're very generous people, and they've got, they're um, you know, warm-spirited, but it just doesn't make sense that, th that this would happen. I'll just go to Jason Clare first. It was your government's idea to actually resettle um, yeah. asylum seekers in Papua New Guinea. Um, what if it doesn't happen? What if the Prime Minister says, well, we've seen this, we've looked at it, we no longer want to do that? Well, the, the agreement's for 12 months. It ends in July, and that agreement does say that uh, people that are found to be refugees would be settled in PNG. So that's the expectation, and to be supported and helped by the Australian government providing housing and education and health services. So that's, that's, that's the model. Two next door neighbours helping each other. We've got a problem with people dying to get to the best country in the world and they've got problems with law and order and education and so health. The, and so just, just can I just work out how that happens? So the Australian government will provide educational, health and cetera services yes, so for to example, a small group of people living within Papua New Guinea but not to other Papua New Guineans? Well, it's, it's broader than that, Tony, because we're building a new hospital in Ley. Uh, David made the point about... Port Moresby. I don't think there's an expectation, there certainly wasn't when we were in government, that people would be settled in Moresby, but potentially in other parts of the country. And there's flexibility in the agreement to provide specific services for the people who are resettled in PNG, but broader services for the community as well. So, for example, uh, at the moment, the AFP is providing an extra 50 police to assist in PNG. I agree. I totally agree with what Jason just said there. Because yeah. Well, this is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because... Um, 
this is a broader package that has been put to to Papua New Guinea and to Peter O'Neill, uh, who does want to see higher living standards for his people. And one of the ways to do that is to get the support of the Australian government. So hundreds of millions of dollars is flowing and they are helping us uh, in dealing with this issue. Have you workshopped yeah. the hypothetical uh, case where the Papua New Guinea government, under pressure from their own people and other politicians, say, no, we're not going to do this anymore? Well, as I said... What happens then? Well, as I said, Scott Morrison just came back and they've agreed now to meet at a ministerial level on a monthly basis with the, pro with the per uh, specific purpose of accelerating the processing and, of course, the resettlement. But these people are in legal limbo. It's just not going to happen. There's no sense of when they're going to be resettled, where they're going to be resettled, if Australia can guarantee their safety. They're in, it's like this bloodless conversation that we're having, when, which is this incredibly cruel system, um, completely inhumane. Um, it's like this sort of Guantanamo for refugees because no one knows what's going to happen to them. Um, it's a horrendous situation, and I think there must be a way of stopping drownings at sea that doesn't involve Australia becoming this kind of um, globally infamous human rights abuser. Can, can I just can respond? Yeah, well, actually, yeah, you can. I want to hear from, uh, I want to hear from our non-politician Sue Morton. I actually agree. I think it's, um, it's very difficult. We're dealing with people who have come from traumatic environments. They can't always find the right or the correct way to get here. They take enormous risks with themselves, for their, their own lives and with their children and their other members of their family. And they're being um, picked up and treated as if they're just sacks of potatoes. And it's absolutely unfair. We, it's unfair on the people that we're, treating, we're looking after and it's very unfair on the population of Australia to think that that's how we would care for people who are not able to care for themselves as well uh, as So like. let me ask you this, because you'd be considered, I think, politically conservative. Um, do you think both well, sides of politics <laughs> have... Do you think both sides of politics have, uh, have behaved badly in this? I, I truly think this is something that should be solved without politics. I think this is one of the few things... I mean, look, we need a strong political system. We need two different sides of... two different points of view. But this is one thing where we're talking about so many people's lives and so many people's futures that we should be able to solve on an apolitical basis. Tony, can I just say, when we are talking about so many people's lives, I mean, let's not forget 1,200 people died at sea trying to get of here. Of course. Right now, that. so what we had to do was to take drastic action. And that drastic action received, um, you know, it was a mandate that we received at the election. And it's a three-party, uh, this is a three... Um, part process and the offshore processing is part of it. Now, if you go back to the end of 2007 and the system that we handed over to the Labor Party, there were very few, less than half a dozen people in detention. Effectively, the boats had stopped coming and that's because we had a deterrent in place. And as a result, broader public support for our immigration system and for our relatively generous offshore resettlement um, system was, you know, went ahead uh, and the people in the, in the broader Australian public supported it. What they didn't support was what has happened over the last five and a half years, which was the 50,000 unauthorised arrivals, which was the 1,200 lives lost at sea and which was the $11 billion blowout. I think okay, if sorry, they I'm... knew what was happening on Manus, I don't think they'd be supporting it. I would draw a line under it there because we've got other questions to get to. It's time to move along. You're watching Q&A. Our next question tonight comes from Mehmed Hasich. Um, this is a question for Sue... Uh, Morford, um, when you were CEO of um, Pacific Brands, you made some tough decisions and closed several clothing factories, leaving nearly 2,000 workers without jobs. How do you now see the future of manufacturing in Australia and what are your thoughts on government assistance to keep the manufacturing sector viable? Ah, complex question. <laughs> um, in the first instance, uh, to put off people because you need to change the structure of a company is an extremely difficult thing to do. And we had a company that um, was um, was highly geared and highly valued at the peak of a cycle. And as the GFC hit and circumstances changed and values dropped, we had to make quite dramatic decisions in order to keep um, banks supporting our company and to keep our company alive. Uh, which indeed we did. And uh, to lose a lot of people from your, 
your business is very difficult, not only for the people who go, but very difficult for the people who are staying. So I think that if anyone thinks that that's an easy way out to solve problems, I think that they would be most uh, uh, do, you, do, you, do you feel when you see uh, Holden and uh, Toyota and uh, now Qantas laying off large numbers of people in many other industries as well, do you sort of think, well, that's what capitalism is really? It's kind of creative destruction. No, <laughs> I don't. I think that we that we, can, we, we should be able to and can run really good businesses and really strong businesses. It's just that... Um, the business world goes through cycles, it goes through transformation, it goes through change. And we need to be strong enough as leaders of businesses to identify what those changes are mm -hmm. and then be able to manage our companies accordingly. We would all like to think that we were able to train the people that are on site with us to be able to be able to take on the next phase of business's future. If those decisions aren't made early enough, you have no choice. You have to be quite radical. And it's not the way you would prefer to go. Uh, there are some industries that once were good and once were strong, um, like the clothing and textile industries that I worked in, that are, no, that are now um, the strengths of developing nations. And so we buy from there. Mm. Versus our nation now has opportunities to do different things. Um, we are... We are ve look, first of all, Manufacturing Australia doesn't really support protectionism. As a matter of fact, we don't support protectionism at all. We think that we need the government to give us strong policies that enable let's, us to let, flourish. Let's, let's focus on the strong policies. How big a factor is industrial relations reform from your point of view? Oh, it's a very big factor. And we what, need what fundamentally needs to change? We need to have flexibility in the workforce, um, in relationships with our workforce. We need to be able to have direct engagement so that we can um, work on agreements with our em employers, employers and employees so that they can um, quickly decide what is good for them versus having third party intervention. The other thing that we um, need is that we need the ability to um, reduce red tape, which we've, which, which we know. Before we'll, you go into red tape, stick with industrial relations for a moment, because one of the big issues is around penalty rates at the moment. I mean, does does your association have a view on the kind of wages and conditions, penalty rates, and other conditions that apply to workplaces? Look, it's not so much the wages, and I have to be perfectly honest about it. It's not the wages; it's all the other things that take the time in going through negotiations with. Um, our workforces to be able to be expedient and set up new factories and so forth. It takes... Um, mm. one, of, one of our members had to take a factory offshore that they plan to do in Australia, spend $700 million um, building a fertiliser plant in Newcastle. They chose to build the fertiliser plant in America. It took them six months to get all their approvals through in the US. It takes up to two years or more to get the approvals through in Australia. It's that sort of thing that costs us money. It's not the wages, it's the nonsense that, nonsense that goes on around the people that so we're So no employed. problem with penalty rates, no problem with conditions well, in the workplace? sometimes work, there are. Yeah. I mean, I, in all varying sectors there are going to be problems, there are mm. going to be some things. Some, some people are paid too much, some people are paid too little. I mean, that's our job as employers and it's our job as colleagues to understand what's fair and what's not fair. Jason Clare. Well, as somebody who worked for five years washing dishes and serving people at Sizzler at Caramar, I think penalty rates are pretty important. Um, I, and, we, and we wouldn't support them going. Um, our industrial relations laws need to be fair and balanced, and that's where the debate will always exist. We don't want to go back to what happened six years ago where a million Australians had their wages cut under work choices. We can't allow that to happen, but there'll always be review to make sure that they're, they're right for the times. Um, the other things that are going to make the manufacturing industry more competitive are a greater investment in skills, uh, more investment in infrastructure Absolutely. and R&D. Uh, they're the sorts of things that are going to make sure that we've still got hundreds of thousands of people making things. There's almost mm. a million Australians who work in manufacturing. Uh, as a proportion of the economy, that's going to reduce over time, but it's still going to be very important. It'll be well, niche manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, and we need to look at what government can do that sets the right environment for those businesses to okay, thrive. Now before, I'm actually going to go... We've got another question on this from Graham Sheether. Thank you, Tony. Graham's down here. We'll just get our microphone to you, Graham. Just hang on for one second. 
It's related to the issue we're talking about, and then we'll bring in the other panellists. Go ahead, Graham. Okay. The current challenge for Australian manufacturing is to transform from old systems and products to advanced manufacturing. Mm -hmm. President Obama recently announced a $320 million uh, grant to set t up top-of-the-line digital technology manufacturing hub in Chicago to make USA manufacturing world competitive based on high-tech, qualified staff and industry partners, rather than transforming low-tech employees from old manufacturing industries. Mm. What are Australian government, industry bodies and small to medium enterprises doing to match this USA initiative? I'll start with uh, Josh Frydenberg, because the question really is, what can governments do and do they have a rightful role? In, in this space. Yeah, well, to that point about advanced manufacturing, there are some fantastic Australian stories going on right now. So we shouldn't be down on our manufacturing sector because we've seen the troubles in Toyota and Holden and so forth. So, for example, uh, uh, the Bushmaster military vehicle that's made in Bendigo employs more than 250 people. It's now produced over a thousand units. It's now gone, uh, being exported to Japan and Indonesia. Our pharmaceutical sector, we now export more from Australia, four billion dollars plus a year, more than we do wine. And, you know, we've got some great Australian stories in our pharmaceutical sector, you know, like CSL and others. Um, what we can do for them is the, the deregulation issue, is the tax issue, is the IR issue, but it's also the free trade agreements because we are living in the most dynamic um, region of the world. There are going to be three billion people in the middle class in the Asia Pacific by 2030. They all want the things that we take for granted. Yeah, tourism, our education, our agriculture and also our goods. So we've just signed this FTA with South Korea which we believe and it's been, um, it's been confirmed that it's going to produce up, towards, up to a $5 billion annual dividend for the Australian economy. It's going to give our manufacturers, our advanced manufacturers, an opportunity to get into the Korean market. We hope to replicate that in Japan and indeed with China. They're the stories that will make um, more jobs created here in Australia, and they're the stories that play to our strengths. Okay, I'm just going to go back to our question. Uh, you've, you obviously have cited a case of government involvement, the Obama government getting directly involved. What do you think about what you're hearing? It's taking too long. The evidence from research and consulting is that the number of examples you've cited are too few. We're going to have something like 9,000 people moved out of the automobile industry mm. that are really are low-tech, expert in certain areas, but they're not going to be able to transform into the high-tech area that is required to really make Australian SMEs world competitive. We talk about going into... OK, all right, we, we need to get you to wind up that okay. very interesting comment. But um, let me hear from Sue Morfitt first. Is there a role for governments in this? Or should businesses be left on their own with no, free, with no red tape and so on? There is a real role for governments. And the role is that we need... To, there's, there's four key things that the government can do to um, improve the opportunities for manufacturers. First of all, I do have to say that innovation actually happens in old companies as well as in new. We could do with hubs, but we also need to encourage the innovation that currently goes on in the companies that we have, mm -hmm. and in small businesses, medium businesses and large businesses. But there are four key things that the government could do that would mean that we would have a more robust manufacturing sector and almost the point where we should be able to say that we have got a manufacturing sector that will actually grow. I'm going to have Things, to get you to make those four points four very points quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> we need an energy policy. We're giving away our gas to export without taking into account any of the needs of our Australian um, manufacturers or indeed households. We need to improve on our red tape. We need to reduce the red tape, which Josh is doing. We need to make sure that fair trade, free trade is fair trade, which is what Jason's been working on, and we need to ensure that we have a strong, flexible IR regime. Those okay. things, manufacturing will be very strong. All right. And I'll just get you quickly to respond to that. I mean, there are four things there. I mean, the energy policy is an interesting one because <laughs> uh, that's a suggestion the government should step in and actually regulate the exporting of gas, keeping some of it in Australia for our own manufacturers. Well, 
Well, look, there, there's many questions on the energy policy because we're exporting so much of our gas and our competitors and friends in the United States are going through a shale gas revolution where they're getting this cheap energy which is fueling their manufacturing base. So it's not a level playing field. But in terms of deregulation, um, I'm absolutely focused on this with the government. We're going to have our first repeal day in just a couple of weeks and we're going to try to remove a lot of the red tape which is stifling our manufacturers, our businesses and may I say also a not-for-profit sector. Okay, we're, we're nearly running out of time but we do have a question from uh, Jeff Prenter. It's on a totally different subject but uh, let's hear from you. Minister, sometime last year a time I think best forgotten. I think you mean former Minister. Former, yeah. You were Minister for Justice, Minister for Justice, and you declared this is the blackest day in Australia's sporting history. You were referring to a tsunami of drug abuse, gambling rorting, and all kinds of skullduggery. From where I sit, and I think the rest of the population sit, so you're either colour blind or the Blackest Day claim was made without one skerrick of foundation. Jason Clare. Um, well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, first, I didn't say that. Uh, somebody else said that, but I did release a report that was prepared by the Australian Crime Commission. It was a 12-month investigation and it found serious things. It found that organised crime, the sort of organised criminals that import illegal drugs, were also importing peptides and other performance enhancing drugs and they found evidence that they were being used by professional sports people. So I was given the report and I was told by the Crime Commission that they wanted to release it and I backed them. Uh, I look back on the words I used that day and everything that I said was correct. But we're talking here about some drugs uh, that haven't been approved for human use and in one case a drug where somebody uh, died in the London Marathon. So it's very serious. No one wants our, our professional sports people to be using performance enhancing drugs and it's been talked about in the shadows for a very long time. I think that it's time to get it out in the open and we need to fix it. You know the Prime Minister hopped into this today and said uh, you blackened the name of the sport with your over dramatic press conference. Well as I said, uh, look back at what I said uh, and everything that I said was uh, you true. didn't. I, I know you didn't use the blackest day uh, quote. That was someone else. Mm. Uh, but um, do you think your press conference was over dramatic? It did give the sense that in every sport uh, that you mentioned, that uh, huge numbers of people were going to be uh, eventually found guilty of doing really bad things, and we, very few we, have. We, we had the we had the problem on the day. We had the limitation on the day that we couldn't identify the sports under the law that the Crime Commission has. Uh, the sports themselves have to identify it. So that was a restriction on us. But we shouldn't underestimate how serious this is. Uh, Assad has concluded their investigation. We'll know more over the course of the next few weeks and the next few months. But if, if putting out this report, closing down some of the places that were providing these drugs and getting messages to players has stopped one person from getting into trouble, has stopped one person from dying, then it's the right, right thing to do. I'm quite, we haven't got much time. I'm quickly going to go back to our question. Are, uh, are you the same Jeff Prenter that founded Rugby League Week by any chance? You've got it, Tony, yes. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm just mean, curious about all these gambling rorts. Where are these gambling rorts in sport in Australia? Uh, it wasn't, there wasn't any... Well, there was one example of that in the report. The report was really focused on uh, performance-enhancing drugs rather than gambling in sport. All right, look, um, I'm afraid, we're, I'm sorry that we're going to have to wind it up there. We'd quite like to hear from other players on the panel, but that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel. Catherine Viner, Josh Frydenberg, <laughs> David Brady, Sue Morford, and Jason Clare. And David, that is your cue. Thank you very much. Next Monday, we'll be joined by the Attorney General and Minister for the Arts, Senator George Brandis, Shadow Treasurer Chris Bowen, the Australian's newly appointed media editor, Shari Markson, and comedian Wendy Harmer. And we'll leave you tonight with David Bridie's song, Treason, his response to the idea that support for asylum seekers is un-Australian. Joining him on stage are Amanda Brown, Leah Flanagan, Dave Foley and Thomas Rann. Until next week's Q&A, good night. <laughs>
Should you seek comfort high You'll find your way eventually Come climb aboard, sail with me The brave ones fled on a pea green boat Sit fire to them, ignore them, and see if they'll float. We could avoid this catastrophe. Come dream a little, dream with. Be not afraid, we're full of noise With a prayer book war, some reckless cause If you allow the divine grace Just stand your ground and we'll come and meet you face to face. Ah, has it all come to Jesus? Ah, has it all come to Jesus now? Has it all come to Jesus? Has it all come to Jesus?